Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar on transition and domination of family firms in a services-led economy. Before we start the session, I would like to announce some general guidelines. All participants will be mute muted. Please type your questions for the Q&A in the chat box. If you face any connectivity issues, you may want to check your network and bandwidth. If they are not an issue, please log out and log back in again. At our end, we will try our best to ensure good connectivity. However, if there are any technical glitches, we apologize in advance. Please bear with us. Um, now I would like to introduce Professor Kavil Ramachandran, the Executive Director of Thomas Schmidtaini Center for Family Enterprise at the Indian School of Business. He specializes in family business, entrepreneurship and strategy and has 33 years of combined experience as an academic at the Indian Institute of Management Ahmedabad and the Indian School of Business. He has authored, edited seven books and published extensively in reputed Indian and international journals. He is the author of the 10 Commandments for Family Business published by Sage. His consulting experience includes areas such as family business governance, professionalization, succession planning, strategic planning, identification of new opportunities for growth, corporate entrepreneurship, and turnaround strategies in family and non-family environments. He has served on various advisory committees of the Government of India, the World Bank, and the Securities and Exchange Board of India. Can you stop it, please? <laughs> the last one, sir. He has been a pioneer academic entrepreneur propagating the message of strengthening family businesses in India and outside. May I now call upon Professor Ram to welcome the speakers. So thank you, Shadra. Uh, happy Raksha Bandhan to all of you. Uh, we are in Hyderabad uh, on, from campus, I'm speaking. Um, so welcome to the Indian School of Business. Welcome to the Thomas Mithani Center for Family Enterprise and also to the webinar, which is on transition and domination of uh, family firms in a service-led economy. So we have uh, over 500 people who have registered uh, for this webinar, which is a sign of the general interest in this topic. And uh, we hope to live up to the expectations. Uh, we have a short presentation to start with on, the, on a white paper we have prepared, but then we will move on to a panel discussion. Uh, we have an excellent panel. I'm very, very happy to uh, introduce the panel, which is a, Fairly diverse. So we have uh, three uh, uh, experts in this uh, panel uh, representing entrepreneurship and family business, uh, uh, representing corporate and advisory, uh, representing academia and uh, consulting and advisory. So let me introduce uh, them one by one. Uh, one is uh, Dr. Uh, BVR Mohan Reddy, uh, Padmasri Mohan Reddy, let me uh, add. He has about, uh, he has four honorary doctorates, which is a recognition of his contribution to uh, the industry, to the economy, to the society. Uh, he has been the chairman of several uh, prominent organizations, including uh, chairman of NASCOM, uh, IIT Hyderabad, CII Southern Region, and of the CII Education Council. Mohan is deeply involved in education in many ways. Uh, he's an honorary consul of the Federal Republic of Germany. Uh, he started his career uh, uh, as a, cor a corporate uh, executive, but soon decided in 91 to start uh, his entrepreneurial journey and set up uh, Infotech Enterprises, which now is called rechristened as Scient, uh, which is one of the leading firms in engineering, manufacturing, and digital transformations. Uh, they have operations across the world, a very successful company, highly, uh, and now currently his Mohan's son, uh, who is a Kellogg graduate, Krishna, he is the leading uh, face of the company now. Mohan continues to be the, the chairman, but uh, Krishna is the, is the CEO. Uh, they have about, over 14,000 engineering professionals in 55 locations across 20 countries. And Mohan is a postgraduate of IIT Kanpur as well as uh, uh, 
uh, University of uh, Michigan. So welcome Mohan to the, uh, to the panel. So let me uh, now uh, go on to introduce uh, uh, Sonu Bhasin. Uh, Sonu is a graduate in uh, BSc Mathematics uh, honors from St. Stephen's and is a MBA from the Faculty of Management Studies, University of Delhi and was uh, with the Tata Administrative Service for several years before deciding to move into leadership positions in different organizations, starting with uh, ING Bearings, the Access Bank, Yes Bank, as well as uh, Tata Capital. She uh, has been on the board, uh, boards of different companies, uh, very reputed organizations, but in between she decided to shift gears yeah, and focus on family business. So she's a prolific writer, she uh, gives lectures, and uh, she's also the founder and editor of, uh, editor-in-chief of Families and Business Magazine. Her uh, latest book is uh, Unstoppable, sorry, uh, Kuldeep Singh Dhingra and the Rise of Berger Paints. So welcome, Sonu. Uh, let me now introduce uh, Professor Savagata Ray. So Professor Ray is a professor of strategy at the Indian Institute of uh, Calcutta. Uh, he is a mechanical engineer, but, and then he did his uh, PhD FPM from the Indian Institute of Management, uh, Ahmedabad. His research interests are in strategy, innovation, entrepreneurship, governance. Uh, I mean, he has been prolific in research across various aspects of strategy and policy and uh, level both macro as well as micro and he has uh, been publishing in top journals uh, for several years he has groomed many phd students he's uh, the best known academic in the area of strategy in india uh, and uh, he's also a well-known consultant in the strategy and entrepreneurship to family as well as non-family firms he has been on the boards of uh, different Tata group companies, as well as some other public sector organizations plus uh, NGOs. And finally, he is an advisor to our center at uh, the ISP, the Fam Thomas Mutani Center for Family Enterprise. So we have uh, three of uh, these uh, great panelists, great experts to steer the discussion. My role is more of facilitating this discussion, timekeeping, and uh, uh, nothing more than that. Okay, let me take a couple of minutes to explain the, the role and the setting up of the Thomas Mutani Center for Family Enterprise at ISB. Uh, we start our journey in 2003 uh, with a training program where Professor John Ward from Kellogg came and I joined and we started offering multiple training programs since then. 2006, seven, uh, Dr. Thomas Mutani, who is a, one of the most well-known uh, philanthropist, industrialist in Switzerland, he came forward and uh, offered uh, uh, support, financial support to set up a chair of family business. And that, uh, because we have been doing a variety of things, uh, he uh, voluntarily, happily for, came forward to give us a generous donation to create a corpus to expand our activities. So 2015, we expanded our activities. And now we have, as you can see on your screen, we have a variety of activities. I won't get into details of it. Two things I just want to touch upon. One is the, the biannual family business conference that we offer now. So seven conferences are over. The eighth conference, uh, because of the COVID, because of the uncertainties, we have decided to go virtual. And that's going to be uh, on 7th, 13th and 14th of February, not full days. It will be half days each. We'll send you all the details uh, once, uh, once we have all the details worked out. But the date is going to be, normally we have it at the first weekend of February every two years. So this is going to be, this is one of the major initiatives we have been doing. And that has actually touched the, every aspect of family business, every stakeholder in family business in India. The other thing, the major thing is research. We have been doing a variety of uh, research projects in India. And uh, the white paper and the webinar is based on the 
the findings of a white paper that we uh, publish. So we are going to publish it today. We will have the, the release. So this is the fourth white paper in this series. Uh, so this uh, webinar on the transition and domination of family firms in a service-led economy. So we would like to release this uh, white paper since we are virtual by, uh, by on behalf of all the speakers, uh, I'm clicking this uh, uh, link and uh, to release the white paper. I think the white paper is coming. Okay, so it will come on the screen now, but uh, let me uh, now uh, introduce uh, uh, Ms. Nubur, it's okay. Uh, yeah, this is the white paper. Okay, white paper. We got it ready in March 2020, but then COVID came and then we decided that uh, it should be released only when things are a little clearer. So we thought that this is the right time to release it. Uh, so Nupur has been the key author of this uh, white paper. So we have, uh, let me introduce Nupur to you uh, very briefly. Uh, Nupur is, uh, Dr. Nupur Pawanbang is an associate uh, director at the center. And uh, she specializes in family business and finance. And uh, she has about uh, 18 years of experience in overall in academia. Uh, she is a, uh, she's a chartered accountant, PhD, and she has got a postdoctoral fellow from ISB. And uh, I would uh, give full credit to Nupur for driving this. Thank you, Nupur, for taking this uh, to this uh, end. And uh, I request you to uh, make the presentation. So just for the uh, information of all the all our friends in the audience. We have, uh, this presentation will be short, maybe about 12, 30 minutes or somewhere there. And then we'll get into a panel discussion, uh, not so much on the report per se, but beyond the report. Over to you, Nupur. Thank you, Professor Ram. Good afternoon and welcome to the webinar, uh, everyone, the speakers and the uh, participants. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Before we begin the panel discussion, we thought it would be a good idea to present a brief overview of this white paper to you. Uh, as Professor Ram mentioned that the Thomas Schmidheini Center aims to advance the knowledge uh, and understanding of family businesses in India and also uh, uh, globally. Uh, with this aim in mind, uh, we undertook, we have undertaken various scientific of different phenomena related to family businesses. In the past, we have published three other white papers and their reception by the industry encouraged us to work on this fourth one. So uh, as, you, as you already know that uh, now in, 1990, in 1991, when the liberalization happened, uh, there were a lot of opportunities that became available to India Inc. And uh, the industrial composition of, uh, of businesses in the last few decades has, uh, has, has gone, undergone uh, quite a lot of changes. So uh, if you see the share, of, um, share in the GDP contribution, you would find that uh, services overtook the agriculture and allied activities somewhere in the mid 1980s when uh, the reforms had actually started slowly. Uh, beyond that, we also found that, uh, you know, a lot of the family businesses which were actually not uh, at all in services, they were mostly operating in the manufacturing, manufacturing area. They stepped up and they transformed, they adapted themselves to uh, become more re relevant in the new era, in the liberalized era. This basically uh, piqued our interest to see how did the family firms uh, adapt themselves, what has been the trends like, what has been the evolution like, and to see this, we have, we've looked at various um, ways in which the family firms, when compared to non-family firms, and also within family firms, the group firms 
versus the standalone firms? How have they performed? How has their contribution been in terms of uh, creating assets? What, what, is, what does their debt structure look like and so on? Uh, our data consists of 4,589 firms over the last 28 years. So it's a pretty large uh, uh, sample of listed firms in India. The data source has been Provis. And in our center, we have a database of uh, the classification of family versus non-family and also group affiliated firms versus standalone family firms. So we have done this classification uh, based on the center's uh, database. About 90% of our sample is family firms, which is pretty representative of the Indian uh, economy itself. Amongst family firms, 64% uh, of the firms are standalone family firms, whereas 36% are business group affiliated firms. So that business group affiliated firms basically means firms which fall under groups like the Godrej Group or the Reliance Group or Tata's and so on. Within non-family firms, we have different categories like the state-owned enterprises, MNCs. We have other business group firms, for example, l and it may not, it is not a family firm, but it is nevertheless a group firm. We have some standalone non-family firms also. Uh, so our sample consists of 51% firms which are uh, in services. Uh, we have a very small sample of the firms which are in primary uh, activities and we have excluded them from our, uh, uh, from our analysis. We basically focus on manufacturing and services. Uh, the first set, of, uh, first set of analysis and the uh, findings that I want to uh, present here is that family firms moved more rapidly towards services. The growth of services within family firms has been much faster when compared to the non-family firms. So you can, you can see that in manufacturing, the, uh, the family firms grew at the rate of 16%, whereas in services, they grew at 20%. And when compared to non-family firms also, their growth in services has been much faster. Uh, from our analysis, we remove, uh, we remove banking and financial services because in banking and financial services, the uh, non-family firms like the State Bank of India and a lot of uh, uh, PSU banks, they basically dominate uh, the, the market and it's very difficult to do any analysis with them in the sample. But when we remove them, then we find that family firms dominate services in terms of assets in terms, of, in terms of market capitalization, as well as in terms of sales. So this clearly indicates that family or business group firms have reinvented themselves, those which, which were, for example, when we look at the Bajaj group, they were typically in manufacturing. Many other group firms were typically in manufacturing earlier, but they've very successfully entered into services sectors and established their dominance in it. The standalone family firms um, have faced a larger percentage change from manufacturing to services, but that is also because the base itself was so long, or so small for standalone family firms. The total assets of both family business group firms and standalone family firms surpassed that of manufacturing uh, in 2018. That means the services sector has higher percentage of assets than the manufacturing as far as the family firms is concerned. Um, and post 2014, the valuation of business group affiliated firms has been higher when compared to their standalone counterparts in the services domain. Uh, we also find that there are a lot of services which can be classified as the modern services, for example, air transport, IT services, telecommunications. So now we do, we did have air transport even before liberalization. Air India was there, but it is still classified as modern services because the way in which the air transport industry operates now has fully overgone a change, a drastic change. Uh, on the other hand, there are traditional uh, services like construction, trade, and public utilities. So we find that the family firms have established their domination in 
modern services as well. Their percentage share of assets in modern services has, has risen very fast. They have almost 100% share. Air India is not listed, hence it is not in our sample. But family firms have a 100% share in air transport industry, 71% 70, share of assets in IT services, and 96% share of assets in telecommunications. The family firms in these modern services are adaptive and entrepreneurial. They, they were incorporated on an average just about 24, 25 years back. They are mostly managed by the first gen uh, entrepreneur with second generation coming in uh, now or uh, being involved for some time now. There is limited involvement of state-owned enterprises in modern services. So government has not been very active in the modern services uh, side. The number of standalone family firms is very large in services in both traditional as well as modern, but they are smaller in size and their percentage of assets is very small. Uh, what we also find is that uh, the non-family firms perform better in, in industries such as public utilities, warehousing and transportation, which are mostly uh, PSUs, and that could be because of the scale and they've been around for very, very long. Uh, in wholesale trade, the multinational companies have done uh, pretty well. The, uh, the modern services, while they have, uh, they have propelled the economy to grow, they've had a spillover effect on even manufacturing. They've been a lever, they've provided a fillip to overall economic growth, but most of the profits for the family business businesses still comes from the uh, traditional manufacturing and from the traditional services businesses. The modern services businesses have not kept up with the uh, performance that was probably expected, but, but they've, uh, they've played a very important role in terms of providing economic growth. Uh, in terms of debt or in terms of the loans that the family firms have been taking, we find that uh, initially family firms, uh, the loans were mostly in, uh, were being taken by the manufacturing firms. But uh, in 2018, the, uh, the, the share of loans of manufacturing firms has come down to 33%. And services now have much more loans than manufacturing, but we have to see it in the context of the various regulations that RBI has come up with, which has made manufacturing firms, uh, it's very difficult for manufacturing firms to borrow now because of various NPA uh, events and uh, the various uh, regulations that uh, RBI has come up with. Uh, we also find that while there is so much of, um, uh, so much of talk in the press and in uh, and amongst policy making circles about NPAs, the overall debt equity ratio, the relative debt of companies has actually come down, but we have a very large sample size and the NPA issue is probably the outliers, the companies which have borrowed heavily, but overall debt ratios have come, come down in the last few years. Uh, Overall, family business group firms tend to borrow more than standalone family firms, and that's also understandable. They have more assets, they are, uh, they are more well connected, they have a better reputation, and hence borrowing may be easier for them. So overall, in, in very brief, our key findings are that family businesses uh, they, and their transition to services has been pretty uh, dramatic. It's been, the growth rates have been very, very steep and they now dominate the services sector uh, completely. When the liberalization happened, there was a lot of uh, doubts in the mind of people whether family firms will be able to adapt or not. But our research, uh, our research quells those doubts and we, we have scientifically with data, we show that uh, those doubts are not uh, valid. Family business group firms dominate in services as well. The transition to modern services uh, has been very, very uh, significant for family firms, but they are not profitable yet or not uh, as profitable as the traditional businesses yet. 
the upsurge of debt in the services sector uh, is more than that in the manufacturing uh, segment. Some of the policy implications that uh, we would like to point out is that diversification is beneficial because many, many of the family firms diversified into services and into newer areas, newer opportunities that became available to them, but it must be planned so that there are complementarities and uh, they, there, there should be a strategic direction for the group. Uh, when we analyze industries, the averages sometimes hides a lot of things. So we have to be very, very careful when we are analyzing different industries. The, uh, the performance of the industries, the trends depend on the number of players which are there in, the, in, the, in, in that particular industry, the government policies at any point of time, the stage of industrial development of a particular economy. Uh, there is a need for stringent monitoring of debt. So painting the entire economy with the same brush that uh, the economy is highly leveraged or there are everyone, every businessman, actually every business person has an NPA, that should not happen. It is a few outliers which, which have a lot of debt and they, uh, some of them become NPAs. Stringent monitoring of them is very important. The, uh, the economy needs a very strong industrial policy that provides direction to the uh, business, uh, to the businesses, when economic slowdowns and recessions happen, uh, right now it seems like there is overdependence on services. But with the with the new uh, new uh, slogan of Atmanirbhar Bharat and Make in India, we may see this change in the future. Uh, there is a significant buildup of an informal economy, so we need to uh, ensure that. There is more, uh, more Philip to the formal sector. Failure to move a sizable chunk of workforce out of the primary sector still remains a challenge for India Inc. Skilled workers, both in uh, traditional as well as uh, modern services, is, is still a challenge. And the, lastly, the government must provide an apt environment for Indian family firms to survive. Now, with this, um, with this, what I would, uh, I would actually invite Professor Ram to start the panel discussion, but then uh, I would like to say that our analysis is based on the last three decades. What does the next three decade hold for us, especially in the post COVID era when digitization is getting so much of, uh, uh, there, there is, it, it's become a necessity. We have kind of fast forwarded the future now. So how will family firms react? How will family firms adapt in the next 30 years is also very important. Another point is that our, our white paper is very macro in nature. However, each business faces many micro issues. And with this panel discussion, we also hope to address some of the issues that individual businesses might face and individual challenges that people like uh, professor, uh, people like Mr. Mohan and uh, in her interactions with uh, businesses, Sono Basin, in uh, his uh, experience with various boards, Professor Sogata Ray, they might have actually come across many micro challenges that businesses face and we aim to discover those as we go along in the panel discussion. So over to Professor Ramachandran, please. Uh, thank you, Nupur. It was really uh, very insightful. Um, I mean, let me just add that uh, at the center, at the Thomas Schmidt Heinrich Center for Family Enterprise, we have been doing a lot of research on the uh, evolution, transformation of family business since uh, liberalization 91. So over the past 25, 30 years, what kind of changes have been happening? So this is one part of our major exercise. Multiple studies are in pipeline. Some of them have uh, come out. Uh, and also because it's a very interesting because uh, uh, globally, uh, all the top economies, uh, the service sector has uh, uh, taken about 60 or even 80%, more than 60% in most of the large growth economies uh, and uh, about 80% in the US. India, it is more than 60%. So there is a huge transformation happening uh, in this uh, area. Okay, so let me start the conversation with our 
esteemed panel uh, members, uh, building on a couple of uh, the findings from the study. One of them is that the family businesses have diversified from manufacturing into multiple service businesses. Second thing is that very many of the entrepreneurs who started their ventures in, during this period, and many of them have become family businesses when the second generation has got involved or other family members got involved. So those are also largely in the service sector, which has I mean, made the service sector such a, an important part of the economy. So my uh, question to the panelists, uh, I will start with uh, Mohan, uh, is that uh, if you look at the, this uh, trend, uh, what has been the drivers or considerations of the uh, promoters, family businesses uh, in the past 30 years or so for this to happen, for this kind of a growth strategy? So Mohan, I, I, mean, I know that, uh, I mean, for the benefit of others, again, let me say that Mohan uh, is an entrepreneur, started from his drawing dining table, if I remember right, and then built a huge, uh, a very uh, respected, very successful ent uh, enterprise. And he has managed the transition, leadership transition to his next generation member also very, very successfully. Highly well-governed family, well-governed family business. So Mohan, so what do you think have been- Thank you, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Actually, uh, congratulations on releasing the white paper. Some of the findings are also very revealing to me. I probably will uh, come back to you or Nupur one of these days to uh, uh, do a little more uh, micro diving to find out more about the basis on which those numbers are arrived at. But I think let me get back to your question about how um, the family businesses are transitioning from manufacturing to services or how they have done over 30 years. I think if you look at um, prior to 30 years, India was a licensed Raj. Uh, India was uh, intense in terms of capital. Uh, and uh, the family businesses were largely driven by people who had uh, a lot of money with them. Capital intensive businesses. You have, uh, you know, capital, you probably bought uh, plant and machinery, uh, hired a few professionals to run it for you. That's how a typical family business would come to my mind 30 years back. But I think what happened over a period of last 30 years is family businesses realized that the potential in the modern uh, technologies, which is largely gravitating towards services uh, in your definition, whether it's telecom or IT services or uh, it's air transportation, um, leave alone, I still don't know whether we can call construction as purely services business, but uh, we'll uh, park that for a minute. And as a result of that, what family business have done is that uh, they've also made sure that these next generation of um, uh, family were a lot more professional, a lot more knowledge driven people compared to what they were. I think that we will see a, a complete shift from what they were in the past to what they are uh, today. So as a consequence of that is that they were handling any new opportunities that were there, irrespective of whether they were in services or in manufacturing with much greater ease compared to what it was in the past. You, I think you took up an example of Bajaj, for example. In Bajaj, I think the next generation that came in uh, were so savvy with uh, the, uh, the whole global uh, scenarios that they moved in very swiftly into, say, financial services, much faster than anybody else. So therefore, but at the same time, I would also say that there is a big distinction between these two, in my perspective, manufacturing versus services. So family businesses or otherwise, also people have been extremely careful in making those shifts. Uh, we, for example, uh, uh, one of course, I uh, yeah, used to be very reluctant to be called as a family business, but now that by definition, my son is uh, the CEO of the company, but I keep reminding people that he became the CEO of the company, not because he is my son. He probably would have been a CEO of uh, a similar size company or a much larger company by now, had he been on his own too. But leaving that apart and leaving apart also, the other thing that I also have is I actually did the reverse of it. That is, we've been a company in services business and the last four years we migrated ourselves into manufacturing. The whole idea concept was, as you explained, you know, we are primarily a design engineering services company and we decided that, you know, look, uh, what we design, we could also manufacture and uh, forayed into uh, manufacturing. And and what we have learned in the whole process is these are two completely different types of businesses. 
starting off with the type of margin that we were accustomed to in services business to what you get in manufacturing or uh, uh, getting down to a number of other issues. There's nothing called inventory in soft uh, services business, whereas there is something called huge thing called inventory that happens in manufacturing. So there is a fairly large amount of learning and as a pro uh, and also dimensions which make the manufacturing business risks are different from services business risks. Uh, so therefore, I think people have made that shift based on what they felt as an opportunity and made sure uh, that they geared to that opportunity by de-risking themselves. And that is where they have become successful. Okay. Very, very, very interesting uh, points. I will come back to you, Mohan, but uh, let me listen to, let's listen to Sono. So what do you think, Sono, have been the drivers or considerations for this kind of a shift? This kind uh, of yes, yeah. thank you, Ram. Um, so I, you know, as part of my work uh, now, and also when I was a banker, I've had the opportunity of interacting with a lot of the next gen. Uh, 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 now, as a matter of choice, and also uh, as a banker, it just happened. One thing that stands out when I uh, look at the interactions that I've had is that the the next gen uh, are the second generation or the third generation of uh, families that made their money and their name in manufacturing because as Mohan rightly pointed out it was you know pre liberalization I think so do you uh screen is frozen it it didn't matter yeah. is this better yeah this is better yeah please go on okay so like mohan said pre liberalization uh, it didn't matter what uh, you did it mattered who you knew because uh, it all depended on getting the uh, license to start manufacturing or doing a business but as a result of which then uh, people who who could start work say in the mid 90s and later they all they all had the advantage of world class education and when they did come back they the way that indian manufacturing was happening was not in line with the world manufacturing and i'm talking of the mid 90s to late 90s and then add to that the Y2K phenomenon that happened that suddenly gave a fillip to a lot of the IT-led services. And it is my hypothesis that the focus on, on, on services started around that time, led by uh, the, 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 uh, the whole hoo-ha around the IT-led uh, services. Uh, it just suited the next gen, it suited their their attitude, it suited their uh, uh, education to get into manufacturing. And this is this also gave them an opportunity not to tread on their father's toes and vice versa. Because one thing that uh, the next gen are uh, quite adamant about is that they do not want to work in an area where uh, they, have, they have their older uh, generation especially fathers and uncles looking over their shoulder. And services was an area where the next gen were the masters. The older generation did not have as much knowledge as the uh, next gen. And it just became what we call a win-win strategy. Uh, the next gen was happy to diversify or set up new businesses focusing on services. The older generation focused more on manufacturing, continued to provide the money that was required, the funding that was required to set up services. Okay, very good. Uh, Sonu, thank you. Uh, we'll continue the conversation, but uh, let's first uh, listen to uh, Sogada next. Professor Sogadari. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ram, and also for a nice answer by Simone Reddy and Sonu. Uh, I just want to add a couple of things already what others have said. There are, I would say two stages uh, in the 30 years in terms of evolution, how the family businesses have shifted to uh, services or entered into services. One is as um, the earlier speaker has spoken about that in the early stage of 1990-91 when the liberalization opened up, 
at that stage, if you recollect that the entrepreneurial pool in India was very shallow in those days. And it was primarily the entrepreneurial pool was limited to the family businesses in those days because the professionally people, educated people for generations, for varieties of reasons, uh, shunned away from, uh, say, starting businesses. Uh, and you know the license Raj, Padmit Raj, and also the political capital, other capital was much more needed in those days. But post-liberalization, that opportunity is emerged. So there are certain professional uh, people like Mohan actually entered the businesses and primarily they chose services industries to do that. But if you look at even those early years, uh, where early years of liberalization where services were opening up, those industries are also very capital intensive, whether it is telecom, whether it is air, air, airlines, etc. And there, the natural advantage was there with the family business and particularly large family businesses. But as Sonu was mentioning, as the time passed by, particularly in the last 10, 15 years, there are many emerging services industries uh, areas are there, where you find that there are not only professionals have entered, but even the next generations of the families who enter to establish their mark, their identity, their signature away from family business or their traditional family businesses. So that's one at a macro level. We see a trend that is more happening because why this shift that is happening in the families from manufacturing to services. But when you come to the micro level, families making choices in terms of moving from manufacturing to services, there are certain, I will say, economic reason, which is also very much prevalent. One is, of course, most of the services industries were actually at the early stage of its industry life cycle in India compared to manufacturing. So as a result, there is a greater opportunities it is easier to enter, first of all, the entry barriers are low. Once the, the economy opened up, the regulations were opened up or it was allowed to enter. So entry barriers are low. The second was the opportunity to grow fast and also make substantive profit. As Mohan was mentioning, the services industries in, in this period actually given much higher profit margin than the manufacturing. So therefore, it was economically more lucrative to be in this uh, business. Second thing that was that also happened, if you look at that when the economy opened up and these many industries were allowed to be entered for foreign participation or foreign firms are allowed to enter, but many of these industries, they had caps on foreign investment or foreign equity participation, and they needed domestic allies to, 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 to enter. And in that context, it was the family businesses which had established presence, both political capital and also the experienced capital to run businesses in this economy, they were the natural partners. So in all these, say, businesses, uh, the telecom, so airlines, etc., or uh, insurance, you see that foreign companies are actually gone to the family businesses for partnership. And third aspects, which is very critical and is particularly uh, relevant, was that if you look at the India's participation in the global uh, global economy, the, by that time, the 1991, India opened up and started participating in global economy in a significant way. The manufacturing industry globally was much more global. And there are entrenched players from East Asian economies and including China, who had taken a pole position in the globalization of the value chain of the manufacturing economy. Whereas in the services of the globalization of the services economy, you would see that it was open field. It was on the early stage of globalization of services. And many of the Indian entrepreneurs, and as the many of the entrepreneurs were actually from families into the services, they could have an opportunity to participate in the global services value chain. Some of the entrepreneurs like Mohan who had started in the first generation, they could. But if you look at many of the other services industries, particularly which are in globalized in nature, actually it is the family enterprises like Wipro, like um, Mahindra's, Tata's, they actually significantly participated in, in, in that. Hi, Sogada. Hello. 
Have we lost him? Yeah. I think something has gone wrong with his uh, uh, system. Yeah. He's, uh, yeah. So I, I think I will uh, continue. We'll. Uh, yeah. So I was dropped off. So I we lost you. Am I audible? Yes. yes. Am I audible now? Yes. 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 Yeah. Yes. And then and there was that unmute. I was not allowed to unmute. Unmute. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So now. I, I think I've finished by the time I went out, I was almost finished that the, the ability to participate in the global value chain and services industry was another motivation because that was the biggest profit earner for the services businesses. Okay. So th thank you, Saugada. Uh, very interesting points. And uh, I, let me continue the conversation on this. Uh, I think the, one of the essential interesting points that you mentioned is that there were different waves at different points in time, what kind of industries, what kind of people came. And the same thing was, uh, I, I think, reflected uh, by Sono also when she said about the uh, 2000 period uh, when the IT industry it and all. So we find that it, uh, 30 years is not one period, but there are different components of it. And one of the other things I found was that um, there was sort of a right through the sort of a demonstration effect of different components and influencing the others. Okay, so if I look at from uh, two angles, one is from the firm family business angle, the other is from the external angle. Of course, the external environment changed, the regulations changed, and that uh, the access to the global market technology changed, uh, licensing changed. Uh, new investments came, funding came, and that's one part of it. But if I look at, uh, as a student, the family business, what I look at it is that, what is the resource pool or the resources and resource basket families have? So that consists of a variety of things. One is that they have a lot of experience of building, building variety of businesses. Even if it is small to medium to large, multiple different businesses, that experience is phenomenal. And that comes as a natural support mechanism for them to enter into new areas. And as Mohan said, the risk management part of it is very crucial. They are able to manage the risk of transition from one sector to another sector much more uh, easily. And yet another thing is that, uh, especially for a fairly established kind of uh, firm, it is easier to attract talent compared to a startup venture. And that too, in the new area, it is much easier compared to a traditional area. For traditional manufacturing to services, it is uh, much easier. Okay. And yet another thing is that the new generation members, and the Sonu mentioned this, the next generation family members uh, came with new exposure, new ideas. So the family resource pool, resources and capabilities pool got enriched regularly, constantly, and they were ready to uh, tap new, new opportunities. And the new opportunities came. So my question before we move to the next, uh, next point is, do you see uh, which one drove what? Or it I mean, uh, happened suddenly or not? Or at the different points in time, is there any pattern? Mohan, can you just uh, reflect over and see whether there is any pattern you have seen in terms of whether the families and entrepreneurs driving this and tapping, creating new opportunities, or the new opportunities were emerging and the families and entrepreneurs went and uh, exploited them. What do you think? My belief, um, Ramu, is that, um, and I should uh, make a disclosure, my exposure is largely limited to IT services. I have to confess that. But it was a combination of both of them. That is, you know, it, it's both were at play. People were looking at uh, an opportunity that was not there. Uh, even um, the family businesses, which probably had uh, a fairly large amount of wealth with them, money with them, were also being uh, bottled up because of this license raj. And once the liberalization came in, they also opened up their mind to say, are there opportunities? And simultaneously, once actually, if you um, uh, uh, go back into history, not that I want to spend too much time there, is that even to travel abroad at one point of time, 
we used to get a permission from RBI. So uh, that was the situation that was there. Uh, that went on for a while till uh, liberalization happened. So I think our exposure to the global world itself was very limited. But once the next generation families came in and they went into the uh, uh, best of um, uh, universities for gaining their knowledge and so on and so forth, they also saw there was a larger pool of people who were saying, yeah, there are other opportunities which have come. So it was actually at a good intersection that happened. That is, the good old family businesses of India were trying to say, look, we need to get some more opportunities. The next generation family came in, saw those opportunities. It's a combination of both of them, which I think has worked to what, where it is today. But I have one thing um, uh, to uh, uh, raise uh, in connection with this, is that we've only looked at the success of family businesses today in terms of what percentages are there, etc. But you also have to look at how many have failed so far. Because I also know of a number of instances where family businesses wanted to, they thought they had money. They thought it was very easy. And they wanted, and they also had, for example, there were companies which had their IT services business within the group. They spun out the IT services business saying that, you know, this will be the new company. Never made it. So therefore, it was not very easy for family businesses to unless they understood the various business models from time to time, had a great appreciation for technology. And I think, you know, it was much, much different. If you look at these, uh, uh, again, the success of IT services, it was also led by exports. It's not domestic centric business. Whereas manufacturing today, um, IT services I'm referring to, I'm not submitting to your uh, global services in general as a definition. I'm limiting my exposure to IT services. It's all uh, uh, export business. Customer centricity is very high, uh, very high to the extent we're finding it difficult for these IT services guys to work in manufacturing, go back to the customer because he thinks that, you know, customer is so important. Whereas in manufacturing with the lower margin, he's also important. I don't dispute that, but with lower margins, he can't have the same flexibility as night services guy has. Uh, so therefore, one has to keep in mind that, you know, the, all this happened because of a uh, number of dynamics and both the dynamics we've talked about, whether it was family businesses being fee feeling that they were bottled up or the opportunities that coming in because of the next generation was there, were a combination of them made family businesses successful in services. Hey, Saugeda. Yeah. No, see, uh, to I want to very, cover very, very a very point. Uh, I would like to um, point out because I started by Mohan that family businesses are not homogeneous. They have a lot of heterogeneity. And one heterogeneity, of course, is that what is the, the what you, you pointed out earlier, the leadership talent pool the families have. So there are families which, who are large families, who have multi-generational families where they have a large pool of leadership. And then there are families which are nuclear in nature. They may not have a large pool of families. So given that, if you have a larger pool of and many of the family businesses which actually are diversified, not only just for in the services for manufacturing as well, you'll see that, that multi-generational, their aspiration to satisfy that to match with the opportunities that were emerging in the marketplace, particularly on the more sophisticated services businesses, they found a perfect match. And many of those new generation family leaders actually gravitated towards starting services businesses. So that's one interesting part of it. And as a result, you see that, and there are, uh, that there was a div significant diversification that happened uh, in some of those families. But there are more nuclear families where you see that the diversification was uh, not much. They diversified, some of them might have diversified from manufacturing to services, but they stuck to that, service, that services business and made it world class or made it larger, stronger, bigger. Here, I would like to briefly touch upon what Mohan just mentioned about the relative performance of family businesses uh, within this period, not only the services of manufacturing. In fact, uh, we did a study in, in ISB, we published in white paper a few years ago on actually looking at the performance of all family businesses vis-a-vis -vis 
all other kinds of businesses. And Mohan, you are absolutely right that we find that significant performance uh, uh, problems with family businesses in general. There are rising, there, there are uh, rising stars, there are great performers, but there are a large number of people or family businesses also failure on that. But in the services business also, you will see that kind of variation that exists. But coming back to the motivational question that Professor was asking, I find that the family dynamics in, is in terms of, and the resource pool in terms of leadership is also an important indicator why some of these families actually diversified uh, in multiple businesses. Okay, thank you. Let me uh, move on to the next question, but uh, because we have some constraints of time, it's becoming interesting. So let me ask this, uh, start with the Tono. Uh, what have been the, the one of the sectors uh, that has grown I mean, uh, phenomenally well is the financial services uh, sector. So uh, what have been the enablers of the rapid growth? of financial services sector, including NBFCs and others uh, during this period, especially the family control. There are quite a few family controlled uh, uh, financial services business. So what, what do you think? I mean, you have a strong uh, banking background, finance background. I thought you would be the best person. So I'll tell us, what do you think? So no. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. Thanks. Thanks for unmuting me. Um, so Ram, uh, it is true that a lot of the uh, financial services companies of, uh, are uh, are dominated by family businesses. One thing that uh, comes up in when I look and when I talk to people is that before the late sixties uh, and even. Uh, in, uh, uh, you know, pre-independence and just after independence, financial services were all family-owned. If you look at Bharat Bank, mm. example, uh, that was something that R.K. Dalmia had. Uh, there was Bharat Insurance that R.K. Dalmia had. Uh, the Tatas had a significant uh, holding in, I think, Central, what is now Central Bank of India. Uh, aviation was Tata Airlines. It's just that somewhere in the middle, a lot of almost all of these got nationalized and uh, mm. but even if the families wanted to uh, uh, explore their entrepreneurial skills in the financial services, they did not have opportunities. What happened after liberalization was that there were opportunities. I mean, uh, 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 new mutual fund were allowed to be set up. Uh, life insurance companies, private life insurance companies came in. Uh, new banks were given licenses. NBFCs were allowed to be set up uh, and, you know, uh, combine this with this bunch of young people who had come back with educate uh, with education from the best institutes around the world, including India. And here is, uh, and I, it is also my belief that the mindset that is required for manufacturing is very different from the mindset that is required for uh, uh, excelling in uh, services. So I think it was just that everything came together uh, mid 90s onwards. There were, there were these pool of talented youngsters from family businesses with the right education, with the right worldview. And most importantly, uh, having seen around the world what, what were the possibilities. Uh, the, the new regulations made it possible for uh, private sector to come in. Uh, one thing that is often uh, uh, seen as a negative for family businesses is that decision making is centralized. I actually see it as an advantage in a lot of times because decision making is very fast. If uh, if the family decides that you know there is an area that they need to get into, uh, the decision making and therefore then the implementation is very fast. And uh, family business owners are you know, the smartest, some of the smartest people that I've met. And if they saw an opportunity where they, they saw themselves uh, making a mark for themselves and also for the business, they went in, uh, you know, head first. And that's how in the financial services sector, 
we saw this huge interest from family uh, businesses. And if you see, a lot of them were people who already had a lot of money available from their other manufacturing industries. Have I answered your question? Yes. And let me just build on that. That's very interesting because historically we have had a very strong financial uh, banking sector. And uh, what I notice also is that there are three kinds of change that happen, uh, especially in the past uh, 91, post-91 period. One is that several of the manufacturing companies started exploring the financial area, I mean, including Chalamandalam Finance of uh, or the Bajaj finance or the Tata finance kind of companies. The variety of family businesses started diversifying from their core manufacturing to service business. And within service also, the many of them moved into uh, banking related, maybe because they understood finance a little better than, as Mohan said, uh, technology or even the export led IT kind of businesses or new businesses which are not known to them, which they are not familiar with and family businesses did not want to venture into a completely unknown territory. So that is one. The second is that some of the traditional uh, finance companies started uh, diversifying what we call as related diversification. So into other areas of finance. So if you are into uh, one segment of the market, move into other segments of it. A third thing that happened was that the large number of small finance companies, including the uh, local uh, finance companies, including, I would say, the chip funds. So many of them became big, I mean, for instance, the food finance kind of companies. They're all small companies limited to certain regions. They become really, really large. And their segments are completely different from the segments of a auto finance company. So as the economy expanded, as the, uh, the new opportunities came, many of them moved into a uh, variety of these segments. So is, is there any, uh, I mean, I, I want to listen to uh, Olu and the others also. So do, do you see any pattern in this kind of a change? Uh, if I bring in, I mean, let me just ask Sarukada because he spoke about the wave pattern, the 91 to 2000 to 2010, or I mean, if I put it into 10 year blocks, somewhere there, and then the hospitality coming in and growing, telecom coming and growing. So, is there any pattern you have seen in your studies about this kind of growth? So, okay. Yes, if I my wonderful question and an observation. If you look at for many of the <clears throat> traditional manufacturing large fam family business groups, actually getting into um, this NVFCs and those kind of things are natural extension because, they, uh, like say Reliance Capital, the kind of um, funding that were required for their to satisfy their growth um, the, the venture, the, they needed certain support actually to to fa facilitate that and. The market for such funding were not very, I'll say, easily available. So they thought that it is better to create their own arm, like Reliance Capital or they say Bajaj Finance, etc., to fulfill that void in the institutional void, as we call it, and benefit from there. So it was not that that they were getting into the the financial services as to become a financial conglomerate. It was more to expand their basic core interest of manufacturing and support that. And that has been one of the major things that you would see whether it's budget finance, et cetera. But as we were discussing earlier, that some of the new generation uh, family people, they were the family leaders, they saw a big opportunity in this and actually accelerated and make it a business by itself. What we see in today's context when the next generation took over for uh, from uh, Rahul Bajaj to Sanjeev and Rajiv, what we see that there is a clear separation and Sanjeev has been become the face, as Ram was, uh, Mohan was mentioning, the face of the financial businesses. So, so you could see that, that the trigger might be to expand their own inherent age old family businesses. But over a period of time, when this business become more profitable and big, they were, you clearly see that uh, the demarcation is happening. The other feature was, uh, which uh, Sonu was mentioning, there has 
is not related to the established family businesses, but it was boutique uh, family farms, which were actually operating in the financial market, which is at a rudimentary stage in the 70s and part of 80s, which suddenly grew rapidly, particularly on the, the stock booking, equity research, and all the merchant banking and things like that. And you see the proliferation of many of those family businesses, which are boutique, suddenly actually have been able to scale up. And even some of them had become world class to participate in the global financial markets. So there is another stream of family entrepreneurs who are not big entrepreneurs to begin with, but has become significantly big and multi generational in this period. And typically, you are seeing this on those investment trading, advisory, mutual fund, market analyst, and those kind of areas, which also actually gave, as Sunu was mentioning, for many of the globally trained or very educated family, say, next generation, they find the natural home into those kind of businesses, which are more white color in nature. And they saw that how those businesses can be extremely profitable in the global market based on their exposure and experience. Yeah, I've been talking about finance, another natural question coming to my mind, especially because financial services are so important, backbone of the economy, it has grown so much. Um, all, Kai, all established existing companies, new entrants, everybody has come. But off late, one of the major areas of concern is about governance quality of governance. Uh, and we have seen multiple companies holding up the economy. First, they has been affected very badly in the kind of events that happened in the past uh, few years. So I, I, I know that Mohan is very active uh, in the CII and other industry association, although he is not from the financial services sector. As an outside observer, what, what, what do you think? Do you find any difference in terms of the governance practices of uh, family controlled financial services business and non family controlled. Let, let me also uh, re refer this to the earlier event, the Lehman Brothers. Lehman Brothers originally was a family controlled business until the, if I remember right, uh, the past 20 years or so. So that is when the family withdrew or family's role was redefined and the non-family leadership came. They had a very active board and all. And you know what happened to the, to the company. So is there anything that is particularly important from a governance angle for family versus non-family businesses? Mohan, what do you think? Uh, Ramu, thank you. A good question. Uh, I'm very passionate about it. Uh, Family or non-family, I think what's very important for organizations are their values. And if you don't have values in an organization, it doesn't matter. It can come from family, it cannot, uh, can be a professional organization too. So therefore, I think what we all have to recognize at this point of time, I keep saying, if it is your own business, you can do what you like. Because I also work with a number of startups. And I keep saying the moment you touch a rupee or a lakh of rupees or crore rupees, irrespective of what it is, it's not your business any longer. You're a custodian of public wealth. You have to definitely say, I'm responsible for it. I can't do what I like. But the more important one is, I think we also have a big challenge in this country because of the legal system too that goes by. Uh, Lehman Brothers or, you know, there are so many examples in the West people have earned on governance. And immediately there was action. They all got penalized, going to jail for a number of years. We also know an a, a instance in IT industry itself, where you know money was swindled to an extent of billions of dollars. Nothing happened thereafter. It's now 10 years old, mm. still not even reached the smallest of the lowest of the courts. So therefore, I think what is required is all of us have to understand the it's not family, non-family. Values become important. And I keep talking also intensely about this thing called greed uh, and fear. Uh, you see, you, uh, 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 greed and fear were also born along with mankind. But the point is that unless you say that, you know, I fear the law, I fear the society, I, I, I fear God, whatever it is, then, you know, everything is in semblance. The moment you start saying, I don't fear anything and I'm a greed overtakes and I become more and more greedy that's when you get into imbalanced situations. 
So therefore, point is to make is family, non-family is not important. What's important is values are more important. Very good. So I, I'm going to move to the move on. Uh, again, we have, I'm keeping a, a eye on the clock. Okay. So uh, see, if we look at the, I'm looking at the, the post COVID uh, period, the Newport closed our presentation with the next 30 years or something like that, whether it is 30 years or 20 years or not. So if we look back, so family businesses responded very entrepreneurially in 91, post 91, past several years, restructuring themselves, remixing their resource basket and adding and deleting many things. So they were very, very flexible in terms of responding to that. Even that Bombay Club responds to what happened to all the companies, that's a different, very, very interesting. So in the current challenge scenario of uh, challenges. I mean, we are having a big tsunami. This uh, COVID is a big tsunami. So what are the challenges of transition uh, family businesses face in the post-COVID? Uh, post-COVID and digital era. Digital revolution was happening. I would say that my observation is that COVID has actually accelerated. that. It was all mm-hmm. going to happen. Okay. So how are they responding or how are they likely to respond or how should they respond? So what do you see? Let me start with uh, you, Mohan. <laughs> and then I'll ask the others. Sure. Thank you, Ramu. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, I think what we're seeing for sure is that uh, there is enormous amount of digital transformation that's happening to all businesses, including the family businesses. And the response has to be in terms of agility, our ability to move very quickly, very swift, swiftly to this current situation. Because uh, Nupur was talking about next 30 years. Nupur, I don't know what will happen in the next three years. <laughs> Forget about 30 years. So I keep saying, you know, we, we all coined this new word called there is a new normal that's going to come by. I, I keep saying no. I think the new the other word I now have is never normal. Because <laughs> every day there is a new surprise that comes in. And not only COVID. I think, you know, COVID is one aspect of life. The other aspect of life you're seeing is this big technology shifts that are occurring. And they will definitely change the face of industries. Not many people ever um, thought about, you know, agriculture will use drones. And now that is a good application, precision agriculture as it's called. Or the amount of technology that will go into hospitals, for instance. Uh, So therefore, the key thing that I'm saying is that people who are very agile, who will preserve their cash, there are some very hard decisions that have to be taken. Um, and those decisions are to be taken at this point of time because of the larger interest of longevity of organizations. And these will continuously come up. If you know um, um, somebody thinks that laying off people is a sin, I'm saying, boss, you're committing a bigger sin by putting at risk the other nine jobs. If you're t- saying that you've got 10 jobs at, uh, in front of you, one job is what you probably want to get off. But if you're saving nine jobs as a result of that, but if you want to keep all the 10. And then as a result of that, what I think will become very important as we move forward is companies would become very light, can swiftly move towards the new normal that will come by every year or every six months. I don't know how quickly it is. Very good. So let me uh, listen to Sonu. No, she's muted. So I think she has been muted. Yeah, now, now, yeah, you know, this is like uh, somebody's delight to mute all the women, you know. <laughs> I'm just joking. So let me, uh, let me look at or uh, talk a little about the post-COVID world in a slightly different manner. I think uh, COVID has been a great leveler for everybody. It doesn't matter how much of money you had. It didn't matter how big a house you lived in. Uh, Everybody is talked by the same virus. There is no guarantee that if you are rich or powerful, you will not succumb to the virus. So what this has also done is that it has uh, suddenly made uh, the powerful patriarchs, the powerful uh, business owners suddenly look at mortality in a very, very uh, real sense. Some, I think Mohan talked about greed and uh, fear. 
I think this fear of death has become suddenly very, very real. And as a result, uh, 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 you know, people who thought that uh, they were immortal have had to look at uh, mortality with uh, a new set of uh, eyes. Coupled with that is the other phenomena, which is a result of COVID, that families have ended up spending enormous amount of time together. I don't think any time in the past 30 years or 50 years, the entire family spent so much of time together. Uh, there, was no, there was no place for them to walk out or go away. They had to find, uh, they had to find place for each other in the family. And as we all know that a lot of the issues in families arise out of lack of communication or miscommunication. I think this lockdown period has, had, has given families no choice but to communicate better. I mean, how much of Netflix can you watch? How much of HBO can you watch? You have to sit down and talk. And uh, you do talk about businesses. And it is, again, my uh, hypothesis, it is my belief that the generations have renegotiated their place with, with, within the family during this uh, lockdown period. And it is, again, uh, my hypothesis that going forward, there is going to be a lot more collaboration, not only between the family members, but also between uh, businesses. Because people have realized that, uh, uh, you, know, a, you know, you cannot, what, what is that, you cannot actually do that. You do need everyone around. Uh, COVID will also throw up again, a huge number of opportunities. There will be a lot of businesses that will shut down. There will be a lot of, uh, 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 you know, industries or businesses that will not be able to propagate. But at the same time, there will be a lot more businesses that will keep evolving because of digitalization, because of new consumer habits, because of uh, the new way of doing business. Uh, that's what I think. Okay, very good. Uh, so, Gita, you have uh, any last thought in one minute? Uh, Hello. To unmute. Uh... Okay. Yeah, sorry. So, what uh, uh, Mohan has said, I believe that the, basically the new elephant in the room is the digital economy, which is are the new generation technologies which are there. And COVID has actually accelerated that process, it, which was supposed to come maybe three to five years later is, is right there. And under some circumstances, I want to just to add to this to panelists what they said, something at a different dimension, following from what we are discussing earlier, that actually the family businesses are in this situation are going to face a very different kind of future then what they faced in the 1990-91 when economy was liberalized. This is the first time the family businesses are going to face a huge set of competition from the entrepreneurial talent pool that has been created in India in the last 10 years and particularly in the last five years, which are who have no family, say, privileges or family business tie-ups earlier. They're all new generation entrepreneurs, professionals, young kids, who have bust into the scene. So the entrepreneurial talent pool in India is actually busting. And that's the talent pool, that's the entrepreneurial pool which are going to, to give very, very tough competition to the family businesses. And I call this is an IPL moment of Indian economy and business. What happened to IP, in, in, if you remember in 2007 when IPL started, many of the mega stars suddenly found foundering and there are many new gender, new young cricketers come, came from different small towns and B-class, C-class cities. And they burst into the scene in the last 12, 15 years. You see that they were actually dominating the Indian cricket scene. So that was the kind of prognosis that I have about what is going to happen in Indian entrepreneurial uh, uh, say market. And that's why the family businesses have to really transform themselves because the way that the, the, whether Sonu says that uh, the traditional way of decision making in the family is centralized, etc. was very useful. 
But I particularly believe that that has to be given away. The new generations have to given much more opportunities to express themselves, to ex experiment, because they have the wherewithal actually to go out and uh, make a difference in these new generations of businesses, or even transforming the existing businesses with new generation of technologies. But they need to have a greater say in the decision making, and uh, then only these family enterprises or family businesses will continue to dominate in the coming decades. Okay. Thank you. Uh, it has been excellent. So I won't take much time. We have uh, time for a few questions, but I just want to close this. Um, I find that the last uh, point, particularly uh, Mohan, uh, I mean, emphasized on the agility part of it, uh, understanding that the realism is that things are going to be very, very dynamic. Uh, and others also mentioned that not to take things for granted. And Sonu also mentioned about the need for communication. But my, my final point is that we need to have very strong decision-making processes and policies in the family, which again goes back to what Mohan earlier said is about the governance part. Family governance is important, business governance is important, but the business it is. If these are two important things, then only we'll have family harmony and business prosperity. I mean, whether it is three years, 30 years, or in n number of years. So over to you, Nupur, for a few questions. Yes, thank you, Professor Ram. And uh, the panel discussion was indeed extremely uh, uh, insightful. We have a lot of good comments in the chat box and a lot of questions, but I'm just going to ask one question to each panelist, kind of clubbing the questions together so that uh, we get as much as possible from the panelists. So, uh, Mr. Mohan, the first question is to you. Uh, there are a lot of questions around, uh, are the family businesses ready to take the plunge into newer technologies, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and so on? And a club with that, there is this one question that if you were to start a business now, in what sector would it be? So, uh, two questions really, what business would you set up now just like in 1991, you started uh, Scient or Infotech, and um, are the family businesses ready to plunge into the high-end technology that seems to be the need of the hour now? Sure. Uh, let me take the first question first. Uh, are family businesses uh, ready to take plunge into uh, newer businesses? I think the answer is it depends upon how the families are appreciating the impact of uh, the new wave of technologies that are coming in. I like to paraphrase with one thing there is that age does not matter. You're seeing senior members of the family trying to push young spirits in the family saying that take the plunge, there are new opportunities that are coming in. So no reflection on my family for sure. I'm talking about several other families that I know. So please, uh, not also it's not a reflection of my age. I'm saying generally, don't get uh, uh, next generation. Are they, uh, the Zen Z is more savvy technology? No, I know elderly people who are also equally good in technology, appreciating technology. The second question that you asked is, where will I take a plunge? I am very upbeat in terms of technology. And this digital transformation, I think it will definitely change the complexion of the world. Look at even healthcare, for instance. A country like India, where we have shortage of doctors, Technology will assist the doctor. I'm not saying it will replace the doctor for sure. Healthcare, use of technology will certainly change the complex of uh, the, the face of healthcare in this country. Even for that matter, education. We have one other big row saying that you know, the quality of education is very poor in this country because the quality of teachers are poor. True. But today, if you see the intervention of technology that's coming in with AI running at the back end, we are seeing that you know the AI can then set in our, uh, the individual learning paths for people. So where will I plunge myself into? Is purely in technology, technology, and technology. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mohan. Uh, the the next question I have is for Professor Sogata. Uh, so there are a few questions around the performance of family firms in the service business. So uh, there's a question that says that. No, uh, the non-family firms perform better in industries like utilities and uh, 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 
basically manufactured and wherever the non family firms are present what can family firms do to become competitive in manufacturing and what can they do to maintain their edge in services okay so uh, if you look at um, nupur how um, uh, some of the successful families have been able to navigate this is that they have formed a structural mechanism called business groups so business group is a mechanism by which they, what they did they allowed the professionals to run the business whereas without losing the strategic control of it so this is something that whether you are doing diversifying into multiple manufacturing businesses or manufacturing services combination or doing primarily becoming a service conglomerates but those families would like to actually continue to perform better in fact been able to navigate in this uh, term uh, say tumultuous time both covid and as well as digital transformation is to actually induct more professionals and give them the opportunity to run the businesses but at the same time they can keep the strategic control of the businesses through a structural mechanism called business group and but at the same time as mohan was mentioning was ram was mentioning earlier there is a greater emphasis that will be needed to actually restructure their governance mechanisms so that as a family they can continue to perpetuate the values and have a better governance structure on that so that the professionals can run that those businesses in a market mode create value but without losing track of what actually the family's emotional socio emotional wealth is uh thank you professor sogata uh, sonu you have worked a lot with the next gen and family businesses and this question is for you from one of our uh, participants they ask that uh, operating in different businesses is fine but being world class is different from operating in the world what is the next generation doing to make indian family businesses world class you know to be world class rather than just be operating in the world you need to know what you are up against uh the the new gen actually knows what uh they are up against because their world view is very different from uh their uh, from that of their forebears so they they know what they are up against they know what has to be done uh, to to create world class organizations they are not afraid to collaborate they are not afraid to bring in talented uh, non family members to come and run their businesses uh, you know the one of the key conflicts between uh, next gen and uh, so i call them the inheritors and the patriarchs the one of the key areas of conflict is their view around talented professionals the pitch see it as a needless expense and the inheritor see it as an investment that is a must with a capital m uh, if they want to do if they want to build world class businesses uh, the the next gen is also more open to getting in the strategic partners they know what they know and they know what they don't know and they are not afraid to bring in external partners to fill in the gaps of the knowledge so when you say what is required i think the next gen already know what is required uh till now they were kind of constrained be because of the fact that they you know the the patriarchs were unwilling to let go i think the covid uh, the the first lockdown which was a stringent lockdown actually has helped and this is anecdotal evidence i have i don't have any empirical uh, data but anecdotally i do know that the patriarchs are now more open to let go uh, and let the next gen uh, follow what they want to do in terms of uh, uh, the gaps that need to be filled to create world class organizations right thank you sonu uh, professor ram i'll end the q and a session with you because there are quite a number of questions it uh, it it's kind of an extension of sonu's reply as well there's there are quite a lot of questions around professionalization so uh, some of the people are asking 
is there any evidence that professionalized family firms perform better than those which are controlled as well as managed by family firms uh, controlled as well as managed by family members then there are questions around is it necessary to bring, bring professionals if there are enough family members available so why should you professionalize i let me clear this sort of a misnomer or a myth uh, very often when i uh, got into the family business area uh, many people used to say that family and professional i don't believe that i believe that any business has to be run professionally whether it is run managed by a family professional or a non family professional depends on the capabilities required depends on the education knowledge skills required for that kind of a business okay so therefore uh, i mean if i take for instance very briefly the apollo group but for dr pratap reddy his four daughters are not medical people it's a highly professionally managed family business all the four of them run it or manage that as professionals so what is required is professional management and professionalization or professionalism means that you do the best thing for the business you have a dispassionate approach you keep family separate from the business and do whatever is good for the business do it so if you are doing the right thing at the right time it may be about strategy it may be about organizational structure it may be about jobs roles rewards anything then your business will do better if you don't do that if you suboptimize that if you compromise that by bringing in keeping fat businesses and employment exchange for the family then naturally the business will affect will be affected performance will come down and there are there is enough evidence to show that i don't I, i don't have anything to quote immediately but there is enough evidence to show that businesses which are run better including family controlled family owned or family controlled businesses whether that those are managed at the operating level or at the strategy level by the family if this distinction is very clear then the businesses will function or do better if these are not followed whether it is family member non family member we have enough cases of non family businesses failing because the managers are not professionals they may be qualified but they don't run it professionally i think that's the where the, the crux of the matter lies i stop there thank you ma'am right uh, thank you professor ram that was a very powerful thing to say at the end of the webinar just to uh, very quickly in 30 seconds uh, Mr Mohan would you want to add something No no okay. please so go ahead to, uh, very quickly sum up uh, the webinar it's very difficult to sum it up because there were so many points which came up but uh, clearly there are a lot of demographic and social changes that are happening and the next generation is playing a very key role in uh, in taking the services and digital economy forward uh, it is customer centricity which will which will define the growth of family firms in the future uh, so to to be world class to to compete in the coming in the coming years it is important to be agile cash remains the king and institutional voids uh, family business group firms they they kind of organized themselves in a way and they took opportunities which were available in a way that it also acted to fill in the institutional voids that existed at a point of time and it may also uh, play a very important role in in the coming uh, future in the coming days uh, again in situations like the covid situation communication uh, starts to improve in certain cases which which has played a very important role traditionally in the performance of family firms so uh, some of these these points came across very strongly in the uh, in the panel discussion we have very good feedback coming in from the participants so thank you very much i hand over to nandil to formally close the webinar uh, we, we are sorry we are not taking any questions uh, any more we are running out of time uh, so nandil over to you thank you nupur uh, that was a very enlightening discussion and well summed up by you 
uh, firstly, I would just like to begin by thanking our panelists today, Mr. Mohan Reddy, uh, Ms. Sonu Bhaseen, and Professor Sogata Ray, who agreed to be on the panel with us today. Uh, I would also like to thank the ISB, IT, and AV support team for their help today with uh, everything going remote due to COVID and the video call being very smooth. Uh, we would also like to thank the marketing and communications department of ISB uh, and the external affairs team, MFAB, public policy, and the alumni departments who have helped us reach uh, the right audience for this webinar. And we have been able to have such a resounding participation. Uh, we would also like to thank the members of the press who have joined us today. And lastly, a very big thank you to the team at Thomas Schmidheini Center for Family Enterprise, who have supported us during the development of this study and the presentation of the findings as well. Uh, with this, uh, we conclude our webinar today. Uh, I would like to thank everyone who has taken out time to attend this session. Uh, I hope that uh, all the participants of the webinar found it to be interesting and thought provoking. Uh, participants may log off now as we will close the session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ramu. Thank you, Ramu. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Good day, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ram. Thank you. Thank you, Mohan. Thank you, Ram. Bye, Sogata, Nandi, Lebanon. We'll touch base. Thank you. Stay safe. Yeah, nice. Everybody stay safe. Thank you, everyone. Bye.